from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. And today we're going to be talking about water resources in Egypt. Water stress and water scarcity are major problems globally, and they disproportionately affect the Middle East. To discuss the situation and what it means for Egypt in particular, I'm joined today by Maret Mabruk, head of MEI's Egypt program. Maret, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Before we touch on Egypt specifically, how big a problem is this across the region? Can you give us a sense of how worried people should be? Okay. Um, they really ought to be very worried. There was a recent World Bank report that came out and it said that of all the challenges that MENA faces, it was least prepared for the water crisis. Now, the Middle East and North Africa is the most water scarce region in the world. Over 60% of the region's population lives in areas with high or very high water stress rates. And that compares with uh, a global average of about 35%. So you, you can see where the problems are. And over 70% of the region's GDP is generated in areas with high to very high water stress. The global average for that is about 22%. So it's a huge problem. It is being made worse by climate change. It's being made worse by conflict. It's being made worse by uh, population growth. It's just, it is a huge problem and people are just, I think, not paying attention to it. It's also complicated by, by things like transboundary issues, because, of course, some water is locally available and some is generated outside your borders. So it really is something that most people should be worried about. There are three things that people ought to be looking at here. One, are the region's water resources being sustainably and efficiently used? And two, are water services being reliably and affordably delivered? Because it's it's no good if they're there, but people can't afford them. And basically, are people paying attention to the problem? Are water risks being adequately um, discussed and mitigated? So a difficult situation that's going from bad to worse, it sounds like. Shifting gears to Egypt specifically, how much uh, does it have to work with in terms of water resources? And how does it fit into this kind of broader regional picture? So Egypt has the Nile, of course, so people tend to think that there's all this water. But as a matter of fact, Egypt has about 58 and a half million cubic meters to work with. 55.5 billion cubic meters come from the Nile due to an, uh, an old colonial era agreement. About 1.3 billion cubic meters come from rainfall. And obviously that depends on what the year was like. And about 2 billion cubic meters come from groundwater. And the problem with the groundwater, of course, is that it's non-renewable. How are water resources used in Egypt? What are the kind of sectors that are, that are the greatest users of, of the water that they do have? There are several sectors, some, um, some you'd expect and some that are quite surprising. So agriculture takes up the, the bulk for obvious reasons. Um, but then we also have industry and housing. And these take up a huge amount of water because, I, I mean, if you don't pay too much attention, you wouldn't think that the housing sector takes up that much water, but I mean, you know, cement. Okay. So the housing sector takes up an enormous amount of water. And then of course you have uh, other sectors like tourism. And the thing with tourism, of course, is when people go to hotels, they expect to turn on a tap and have it, you know, gush out. And this is a huge personal pet peeve of mine. Egypt has many golf courses and uh, it takes an obscene amount of, of water for a golf course. Now, I think they are building fewer of them than they used to, but, you know, still. And then, of course, there's Nile navigation. And actually, navigation and tourism cross over because of the cruise boats. But um, there is a lot of navigation that goes up and down now. On that, that point about golf courses, I'm kind of curious, how, how much does the government factor this into the economic development plans? I mean, does it make sense to be building these golf courses? I mean, on the one hand, you're getting the tourism revenues, but on the other hand, you're using up precious water resources. How do you strike that balance? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think that about 10 years ago, people weren't striking that balance. Um, people were building these big resorts, especially along coastlines and... and um, you know, golf course is the way to go because the argument was, well, tourists will come and they will want to play 
um, golf along these gorgeous coastlines. And they are, they're gorgeous coastlines. And I'm sure it's very nice to play golf, but there wasn't anything in place that insisted that these resorts that were springing up, for example, had to have desalination plants. So most of this was groundwater. The situation is slightly different now, I think, it's because it's so urgent and because there was a, um, a plan put in place back in what well, started in 2005 and it, it's, it was renewed in uh, 2013 uh, and it's moving through to 2037. Um, and I think you are not about to see any more big results with big golf courses that are not being taken care of. So the planning has been adjusted, the kind of parameters have been they adjusted. Are attempting, yeah, they are attempting to adjust it. Egypt is on this huge economic reform tear at the moment, um, which has had fantastic results on the macro level, but has been very, very difficult on, um, on the individual citizen level because of the austerity involved. So there is a huge argument with with wanting to go ahead and, and, and develop. And, you know, that's that's all very well. And it is in any country, but it, more so in a country where that resource is so limited, there is a huge tug between how much we can develop and how careful you want to be with that water. Shifting from the resource side of things to the infrastructure question, what kind of state is Egypt's water infrastructure in? How much how much water gets lost through leakage and things like that in, in the distribution and transmission process? So you have two main problems. You have the water courses and the drainage systems. And those are not only deteriorating, there's a great deal of illegal use and, and people just hacking through to get better uh, um, irrigation for themselves. Um, it's, it's a huge network and very, very difficult to police. I mean, it's quite common to to have something flooded over or dried out because then you can use that uh, agricultural land for building and it makes more money. So that happens a lot and it is a huge strain and one that requires constant upkeep. And then, of course, the, the current water transmission pipelines, a lot of those are on the older side. And if they leak, it means two things. It means a loss of valuable freshwater resources, and it means pollution. So it is um, a huge struggle to try and and, um, sort those two issues out. Taking a step back, what do you see as the kind of biggest challenges facing Egypt on the the water resources front? You have several challenges. One um, is population growth. All of those people, all of those new mouths to feed have to have water. And it's not a massively renewable resource. So what there has has to be managed well. And it hadn't been to date. They're working on it now, but it hadn't been to date. And those resources need to be managed well. Climate change is uh, is a huge problem. I mean, you, you can see it in the loss of levels in the Aswan Dam. Inefficient use of water is a huge problem. Uh, Egyptians have been farming in much the same way for the past 7,000 years. Um, It is not always efficient. In fact, it is rarely efficient, and therefore the government is trying to bend over backwards to try and sort that issue out. And the farmers are a very, very dodgy problem. It is not, it, it's not easy to sort that out. We, we can go into it later. And of course, there is the need for development, which requires more water. So there are many, many, many challenges. And I think, again, one of the biggest one is, of course, the, the Nile is, um, it's a transboundary issue. Egypt sits right at the end. And there are several countries upstream. And there are currently serious issues on, on that. I wanted to ask about that specifically, given that seems to complicate the whole equation. It's not something that's entirely in, in, in by any means in there in the government's control to uh, to address. How much does that kind of complicate the, the dynamics around this? It complicates it enormously because it's no good you saying that you are going to keep your house clean if your neighbors insist on holding parties every other night. It doesn't work. And in Egypt, it's complicated. At the moment, it's complicated by um, what's called the GERD. It's the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that's being built in Ethiopia. The conditions for that are odd, to say the least. Generally speaking, when you have a project of, of this size, it has to be conducted. I mean, before before anyone sticks a shovel in the ground, you have to have what you call an SEO, which is an environmental social impact assessment. 
and that will tell you what the likely ramifications of, of this dam are. This did not happen with the dam. Uh, not only that, I mean, the Ethiopians have been obfuscating, just stalling for the past... I mean, this, this dam was announced in 2011, and over the past nine years, there has not been an internationally agreed upon SEO. There is no way of knowing what the effects of this dam are going to be. Now, the Ethiopians have said that there will be no effect, but we have no idea. Back in 2012, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan um, established an international panel of experts to make a preliminary assessment. There was a report produced in 2013. Now, when that report came out, it said that of the 20 documents required, seven just weren't submitted at all. Nine, I think, were outdated or irrelevant. And the IPO recommended a scope of work for an ESIA, which was ignored. Egypt has asked for international involvement consistently. The Ethiopians have not agreed. And there are, apart from, from the water issues, there are apparently safety issues with the dam. And the safety issues are incredibly urgent, I, less so for Egypt. I mean, Sudan is going to get it in the neck if anything happens with that dam. Khartoum is likely to be 25 meters underwater. Um, and Egypt would have to move very, very fast to try and mitigate catastrophe. But I mean, generally speaking, I, I tend to fault Egypt's government on its handling of many, many, many things. This is not one of them. This is one of the very rare cases where they have sort of bent over backwards to do the right thing. But, you know, it's a two-way street and um, there is no internationally agreed plan going forward for this. Is there any prospects for this, the kind of negotiations changing anytime soon? Or? Uh, well, Egypt has just submitted, and this is like just uh, submitted another agreement, which is is actually an enormous dispute in Egypt because a lot of people say that Egypt is giving up too much by this agreement but I think the government is is thinking we need to see how we can get moving on this right and we'll you know we'll, we'll they'll have to wait and see what the Ethiopian government said I mean there had been a great deal of hope when Prime Minister Abe Ahmed was was voted in because um you know, he seemed terribly willing to work with all of his neighbors Eritrea Egypt you know um, but so far, nothing has happened. And of course, water is a security issue. So there's an enormous amount of worry about that. Switching back to Egypt, kind of domestic situation, what is your, your kind of long term outlook for Egypt's water resources? I'm hopeful, I think, because the government and various businesses have realized that their backs are up against the wall. It's more difficult with people. Essentially, I think because people paid so little for water for such a long time, and because it was always there, nationally, there is the feeling that, well, you know, we've got water. But there are many places in Egypt that live less than a kilometre away from the Nile and do not have drinking water. So th there is there is an issue there. The government is desperately trying with public awareness and with education and all the rest of it. But it, it is it is most difficult with the agriculture. For example, the government has attempted to stop farmers water intensive crops. I mean, in Egypt's agriculture, it has 55.8 billion cubic meters of water to use, but it actually needs about 80. Now, that gap is made up um, not just in recycling water. Egypt is actually very, very good at recycling water. It, it recycles more than 80% of the water that it can, but still. That gap is made up by virtual water use, which essentially means that you import the things that you, know, you would otherwise have grown. But with agriculture, it's difficult to have an understanding of it if you don't have an understanding of the Egyptian market. You, you, you can just say, well, they can just tell the farmers to stop growing that. It doesn't really work out that way. Within the Egyptian diet, there are things that you can substitute for and there are things that you can't. For example, if you can't afford meat, then you go to chicken. If you can't afford chicken, you go to fish. If you can't afford that, you go to eggs and then cheese. There is no substitute for rice in that way, like there is no substitute for beans, like there's no substitute for tomatoes. So the rice growers and, and the, the farmers that operate these huge cartels, they hold a lot of power. The Egyptian market is an incredibly rapacious one. And, and it, it doesn't, I mean, it should follow that if you have 
less, let's say, less rice, you grow more of something else. That doesn't work either. The market is very strictly controlled um, and not by the government. So it's it's very, very difficult to get around that. But so they're trying to get them to grow other crops, but that requires putting in money to try and get them to grow something else. Because, for example, if you switch over to beets, well, they use water as well. And they're trying to make it financially viable, but it's still, it's it's a hard slog. And of course, the agriculture is is the biggest consumer of water. So you can, you can talk to people, you can um, talk to businesses, but there are a few rays of light on the horizon. Desalination, which by the way, also has drawbacks. I mean, it, it, it can lead to greater salinity and seawater, and it, it does have environmental drawbacks, but still. Um, it requires a fairly obscene amount of energy, which Egypt didn't have. So the recent finds in the eastern Mediterranean have come as very good news, mostly for Egypt's business needs and for things like water desalination. So it is hopeful, but... It remains to be seen how Egypt will handle it, but it also depends enormously on the issue with the um, the Ethiopian dam. We're running short on time here, so we'll probably uh, we'll need to wrap things up. But any kind of final thoughts? Honestly, I think the government has woken up to the fact that there is a problem, and you know, better late than never. But it requires very fast move, and, and the, the Egyptian government is not always really fast to pivot on its heels. Now, they're trying, but we'll need to see. But I do think that in, in this case, it's going to require work at home, but in also an enormous amount of diplomacy to sort out the dam issue, because people, dis- when they talk about the dam, they just talk about uh, how much water is going to be filled up. And by the way, that dam can hold the entire rainfall for the entire annual rainfall for the Nile. It is huge. It's not just a matter of how fast that thing is filled up. It's also a matter of uh, how many turbines you use, at what percentages you use them, and also what time of the year. I mean, if if they release water and it, you know, it's it's too late for the harvest and uh, sorry for the for the crops, then that's fairly useless as well. So it's going to require an enormous amount of diplomacy as well as work at home. So I'm hopeful, but I do think it's something that everyone needs to be seriously concerned about. Absolutely, both in Egypt and and across the region more broadly. Definitely. uh, uh, I I mean, Egypt actually is not one of the most highest stressed countries in in the region. Uh, There are many countries that are significantly well off and that use up a lot more water per capita. So, uh, yes, it's it's definitely a, an area that needs to be careful. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave things there for today. But, Marat, thank you for joining the program. Oh, no, thank you for having me. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.